on that system, Michigan. Wait, you forgot. That Berkeley was on that system. Record? <laughs> uh, no, the, the 10 minute after system. Michigan, we had oh. that as well. Um, not at Greensboro though. Started here in a moment. Doesn't seem fair to make the speaker waste 10 minutes. I'm good. At least I don't have to fly across the country <laughs> to be with you all. All right, it looks like it is time. So I would like to introduce Yes? Yes. Okay, so I would like to introduce our speaker today. It's Trevor Hoppe. Uh, Trevor is Assistant Professor of Sociology at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. A key focus of his work is the analysis of the social control of sex by institutions of medicine, law, and public health. His 2018 book, Punishing Disease, HIV and the Criminalization of Sickness, was published by the University of California Press. It won the 2019 Sociology of, Sexuali Sociology of Sexuality's Distinguished Book Award, as well as the 2019 Edward H. Sutherland Outstanding Book Award from the Society, of Social Pro Society for the Study of Social Problems Law and Society section. He's co-editor of two books, including the forthcoming book, Unsafe Words, Queer Perspectives on Consent in the Hashtag Me Too Era. His talk today is titled, To Make a Predator, Punitive Medicine and the Social Control of Sex Offenders. I'll give you Trevor, please mute yourself if you were unmuted before. Um, okay, take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Sam, for that introduction and thanks to everyone for joining today. It's a thrill to be able to be with you to talk about this new work and I wanna emphasize new I'm going to share a lot of information that I've collected in the process of, of sort of getting started with this research project. I'm really looking forward to the Q&A where hopefully we can get into some uh, thinking through some of the issues that are emerging from this project um, right now. So this is a nascent project and I really appreciate you um, and everyone uh, kind of thinking through some of the issues here. So I'll give you some background on what kinds of laws that I'm here to talk about today, um, what they mean, who they impact. I'll talk a little bit about the scope of the whole project. Obviously, I'm, I'm not going to be able to talk about the whole thing, but I'll, I'll sort of give you a sense of where, you know, what directions I'm going in in this uh, work. I'm going to talk about a report that we released last uh, October with the Williams Institute at UCLA. Um, which is their LGBT think tank um, on civil commitment of sex offenders, which provided me an opportunity to kind of get some, to hit the ground running with some of this demographic research that I'm gonna talk about today um, as I work towards the book project. I'm gonna talk about Florida in particular and some of the very preliminary findings coming out of that case study, why Florida, I'll talk about all that and, and what makes Florida special and then some lingering questions and issues um, that, like I said, I really hope we have time to kind of um, dissect a little bit in the Q&A. So today I'm talking about sexually violent predator laws in the United States. These laws were passed in the 1990s and in the 2000s here in the US in 20 states. Um, and there is also a federal statute. So if you're convicted of federal sex offenses, you could be civilly committed by the federal government as well. Um, what is civil commitment? It is the indefinite uh, civil detention. And so indefinite means ongoing without an end necessary. So if you commit a crime and you're sentenced to 10 years in prison, that's a definite term of, of, of incarceration. Indefinite means it's just ongoing. It could be forever the rest of your life. And in many cases, uh, many people do uh, die in civil detention. They never get out. 
Um, it happens when you are released from prison or jail or juvenile detention, some sort of confinement um, in, in almost every state. That's how it works. The state will petition to commit you uh, before you actually are uh, discharged from, from one of those facilities. In most states, you must be convicted of a sex offense in order to be considered for civil commitment. And sex offense is a pretty broad, capacious category, right? There, there are many things that are categorized as sex offenses, and that varies tremendously by state. You also have to be um, considered to have, quote unquote, a mental abnormality. Um, and in some states, perhaps, um, or a personality disorder. Uh, mental abnormality is not a medical term. It was not invented by medical professionals. It is a term invented by lawmakers. Um, and so that really starts to signal some of the sort of weird hybrid kind of medical criminal legal uh, forms of social control that these laws um, have kind of implemented. And it's very different from any other kind of offense. Um, if you're convicted of you know, murder, for example, and you're sentenced to a prison term, you serve that pr prison term and you are released. Um, they can't, there's no uh, systematic procedure in many states to, to, to keep people locked up after their prison term ends on the basis of some um, broad category like having a mental abnormality. Uh, so it's specific to sex offenses and is not the case for other kinds of crime. Um, and that also as a sexuality researcher interests me here. You know, what is it about sex that, that has us so uh, inventing this kind of new category of control? There is not a lot of empirical research on these laws um, or their implementation. Uh, they tend to focus on kind of practical issues such as release rates. As I said, many people don't get out um, and this is more extreme in some states versus others. But in this study, you know, that I'm citing here from 2007, for example, uh, they estimated that there had been about 4,500 detainees as of 2006, and less than 12% of those had been released. Um, in some states like Minnesota, uh, almost no one gets out. Um, and then in other states, it's more common. So there's a lot of variation there. Uh, they also have um, the Sex Offender Civil Commitment Program Network, which is a practice, uh, a network of providers that releases a survey every year. Uh, they have these kind of census figures that they put out that I'll be citing in part today. Um, for example, you know, they find in 2018, there are about 5,400 detainees under these laws in these 20 states. Um, and, uh, you know, they estimate that they're almost about 70% white. 99.9% .9 male. The number of female detainees under these laws, you could probably count on two hands in the entire United States. Very few cases involving women offenders. Um, uh, I should note here while I'm talking about gender, it is possible that there are a number of transgender detainees. The state makes no, it, it's impossible to identify them based on the data that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, and so that's a sort of um, a challenge is I, I can't really get at that population based on the data provided by the state because they're just coded as their biological sex um, without regard to their gender identity. Um, and there are also studies about costs. You'll hear a lot about costs with these programs. Um, for example, New York State spends about $65 million a year to detain about 300 offenders, and that works out to about 175,000 per offender per year. Much more expensive than prison, um, and much, much more expensive than probation um, or sort of other residential kinds of uh, surveillance that, that might be instituted as opposed to this um, involuntary commitment program that they've devised. Sort of struggling with how to conceptualize where these laws sit between institutions of medicine and the criminal law. They kind of are a hybrid model of control. They would exist maybe at what Temmermans at Gabe have called the medical legal borderland. Um, so on the, in the aspect of criminality, we're dealing with a population of people who have been convicted of sex offenses. Um, 
it is involuntary and that deprivation of liberty mirrors the criminal law even though that this is done under the civil law not the criminal law it looks a lot like um uh, a prison even though it may have the word hospital um on the front of the building uh it involves a trial by a judge or a jury um in most states uh much like a criminal proceeding might now there are different standards of evidence um, but it kind of has these elements that look a little bit like the criminal law on the medical side though whereas criminal records are generally public record especially felony records and most states are are very public um, these facilities um, and people who are in them states claim are protected by um, hipaa and health privacy laws and so it's very difficult to find out information about what's happening in these facilities, even the number of people in them. States don't publish um, a lot of information because they say these people are being medically treated and therefore, you know, we don't have to tell you who they are or much about them. Uh, it also involves the civil law, so civil rules of, of evidence and procedure. Um, and an important one there, you know, just to give you an example of what that means, when you're convicted of a crime, you must be convicted beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the standard of evidence. Under the civil law, it's um, a preponderance of evidence. So it's just like which side has more evidence than the other. And so that means it's easier to, um, to find someone to be a sexually violent predator than it might be to convict them of a crime because the standard of evidence are, are lesser under the civil law, even though the deprivation of liberty is potentially more severe, meaning, you know, potentially the rest of someone's life. Uh, and it's also medical in the sense that, right, they, they couch it as offering treatment, even though research suggests that not much treatment is often happening in these facilities. And by and large, you know, what is being offered is not particularly effective um, at, at, at intervening in these people's lives, reducing recidivism and other kinds of issues. So it's really neither properly medical nor criminal. Um, and so finding ways to talk about it require a kind of gymnastics that I'm still working out. Um, the American Psychiatric Association is vigorously opposed to sexually violent predator civil commitment. Um, and in their 1990 ta 1999 task force report, they have some very strong language uh, explaining that. So they say sexually, sexual predatory commitment laws establish a non-medical uh, definition of what purports to be a criminal, uh, a clinical rather condition. And doing so, legislatures um, have used psychiatric commitment to affect non-medical societal ends. Um, and this represents an unacceptable misuse of psychiatry. So it's really interesting that mainstream psychiatry has been opposed from the beginning um, for a variety of reasons. But one is this standard, uh, they say that legislators have, have created this kind of quasi-medical category of um, mental abnormality, which, which has no real medical meaning. It's very open to interpretation. So lawmakers have kind of invented this hybrid pseudo-medical quasi-criminal um, label, um, both mental abnormality and sexually violent predator in order to control uh, this class of offenders. Um, and so the state at the one hand gets to claim medical privacy protections, which has meant these programs operate in relative obscurity, um, while at the same time bypassing all the kinds of constitutional protections that would be afforded to criminal defendants under our laws. This is not the first time that uh, sex offenders, people convicted or accused of sex offenses have been sought for commitment under, um, uh, under the law in the United States. From the mid to late 19th to the mid 20th century, there were a class of laws called uh, sexual psychopath laws. And these laws look very similar. The only primary distinction is that um, they, you could be just accused of a sex offense. You didn't have to be convicted under these statutes. That's the primary difference. But the end result was the same of, of involuntary civil commitment um, that was ongoing. 
And one of the things that interests me about the parallels between uh, this form, sexual psychopath laws, and the newer form, sexually violent predator laws, is the kind of racial dynamics to the population that's impacted. Lancaster, Roger Lancaster here kind of neatly summarizes his historian Estelle Friedman's argument about this. She says, or Lanc Lancaster says that Estelle Friedman notes that sex offenders confined to mental institutions tended to be white men. They were often middle-class professionals um, and that thus marks the development of a racial double standard. Because black men were understood to be naturally or willfully violent, African-Americans accused of rape were seldom held under sexual psychopath laws. They were sent to prisons or executed instead. White sex offenders by contract, contrast were coded as sick. And so you can see some of the um, issues here about uh, the, the sick label and who gets his cast as sick, historically um, disproportionately white. And so that's one of the sort of first things that I wanted to kind of uh, attend to in this work is to, to look at the demographics of who was being impacted by these laws. And so I'm gonna uh, hopefully get to some of the key issues there with the current statutes. Sexual psychopath laws were largely repealed or abandoned um, beginning in the 60s and 70s as part of a broader move away from institutionalization. Uh, you may have heard of deinstitutionalization, just the general trend away from involuntary commitment, both uh, for a variety of conditions, not just for, for uh, people convicted of sex offenses, but people with uh, mental illness and with developmental disabilities. So sexual psychopath laws, except in, in maybe one case, uh, are no longer in effect um, in the United States, but these new class of laws very much resemble them. So some primary research questions that are driving this project right now, uh, first, just demographically, you know, who is being impacted, trying to get a sort of um, foundation to work from to ask some of these questions. Um, historical questions about legislative history, what prompted lawmakers to pass these laws, and some more conceptual or sociological questions about how authorities go about labeling and controlling sexual deviance as badness and or sickness, using that kind of classic Conrad and Schneider uh, framing. Uh, alongside that, right, are different methodologies that I use and am using in this project. Um, so I'm analyzing original data sets of civilly committed persons and registered sex offender populations in order to ask some of these demographic questions. Second, I'm compiling um, an archive of the legislative histories in um, both states that passed these laws and states that didn't um, to try to understand what were the forces that drove these debates in the 90s and 2000s. And uh, sociologically looking at um, public court records, doing content analysis of court cases, transcripts um, in particular, um, and possibly also interviews with forensic psychiatrists and people who have been committed or currently are committed um, under these statutes. So um, a kind of mixed methods, qualitative methods approach. Um, today, I'm gonna to be talking mostly about the demographic work to try to get a, just like I said, it feels to me like a foundation to ask many of these questions. And so I'm gonna start by reviewing some of the findings from this Williams Institute report, which is out, it's freely accessible. If you just Google Williams Institute civil commitment, you'll find this report. And it just um, gets some very basic figures out there, um, including the number of detainees. And again, you know, it seems like so foundational and yet it's, you know, there has not been a lot of published work uh, describing this looking at the racial demographics of the people who are being detained under these laws um, and, and trying to analyze the sexuality dimensions of who is being impacted, um, as we'll see in this presentation. So I'm using a variety, we use a variety of data sources in this report to generate rates of commitment. On the kind of numerator side, we're looking at um, data that we obtained through Freedom of Information Act requests to agencies that run these programs in every state that has one, as well as uh, 
um, circulated findings from the Sex Offender Civil Commitment Program Network. Uh, they regularly report numbers of detainees and some information about their racial demographics. On the denominator side uh, with the rates, um, on the one hand, looking at census data, uh, adult residents from the American Community Survey. Um, also though, as we'll see, looking at uh, using the sex offender registry as a potential denominator as well to try to get at some of the things that could be driving these disparities. And I'll walk through all that in, in just a minute. So three main questions empirically that we grapple with in this report, very fundamentally, how many people are we talking about? Are people of color disproportionately civilly committed and are sexual minorities disproportionately civilly committed? At the population level, we find that there are 6,351 people uh, detained in civil commitment programs across 20 states in 2018. This does not include the federal government, which only responded with figures from 2019, um, where they had 49 people in their facility in North Carolina. Uh, you can see the five states with the largest detainee populations. Some of them um, would be expected given the size of their population, like California uh, has the largest program with 949 detainees. Um, but Minnesota is sort of an interesting case where they have a very, very large program that's disproportionate to the size of their population. And then Florida, Illinois, and New Jersey. Mapping that out, you can kind of get a sense of where these programs are. And sociologically, one of the things that I'm interested in tangling with in this project is that you'll see it's not always the states you might expect that have these programs and some of the biggest programs. Um, and in fact, many of them tend to be kind of uh, classically, you know, uh, blue states, um, Washington, uh, California, Minnesota, New York, New Jersey. Um, it doesn't fall on partisan lines in the way that you might um, expect. And that's one of the things that I hope to grapple with in the project is the kind of political forces up um, that have, have shaped the development of these programs in the United States. Um, because liberals have often been quite keen uh, to implement these programs. In terms of racial characteristics, um, this was possible to do in 12 states that had ethnicity data available. Um, as some of you surely know, when you look at corrections data or, or data from um, the state in general, oftentimes um, Hispanic or Latino folks are just coded as white. Um, this was the case in some states, but in 12 states, we were able to um, code non-Hispanic white folks and distinguish them from Hispanic and Latino populations. Um, in 10 out of 12 states, we found that Black residents faced greater rates of civil commitment than whites, and we'll look at those in a second. Uh, on the whole, average rates of civil commitment per 100,000 uh, 16 and older residents um, we're about uh, more than twice as high for black residents, about 7.72 per 100,000, non-Hispanic white about 3.11, and Hispanic 1.12. These trends mirror some other trends in sex offense policy, and that's one of the things that hopefully I'll be able to get into with, with this project is asking some of the questions of what's driving these disparities. Um, right now, I'm just sort of going to name that these disparities exist, but obviously I'm very interested in thinking about why Hispanics have much lower rates um, and, and Black folks face such higher rates. If you look at Black to white ratios of rates, um, you can see Pennsylvania and Kansas are the two states where whites faced higher rates of commitment. Um, Pennsylvania is interesting because it's the only state that only commits juveniles. Um, and so, you know, I think Pennsylvania deserves a little more investigation uh, to really get some analysis of what's going on there. Um, and then any, you know, any number greater than one means that Blacks face higher rates of commitment, up to five times higher rates for uh, New Jersey residents, Black New Jersey residents, as compared to whites. Um, so that sort of gives you a sense of, of the variation from uh, in these 12 states, um, but by and large higher rates in 10 out of 12 of those for black residents. 
In the report, we are able to present also an analysis of, of what would these trends look like if we use sex offenders as a denominator instead of the uh, census figures. Um, and I, we do this in part because um, we're interested in to try to see what are the effects that are specific to civil commitment and can we disentangle them from some of the forces that are just about criminalization more broadly. Um, it's not perfect because you don't have to be registered as a sex offender to be um, committed, right? You, you have to be convicted of a sex offense, but if your sex offenses are quite old or if they were juvenile offenses, you may not be registered. So uh, roughly 80% of, of the detainees that I've looked at um, are registered. So it's, you know, th there is a lot of overlap in these populations, um, but it's not a perfect overlay. This analysis was only possible in three states where um, eth ethnicity data was available in both the public registry and the civil commitment figures. Um, and so you can kind of see we're working with what we can in these cases, um, because in most states on the registry, Hispanic, as I said before, Hispanic people are just coded as white um, and there's no um, way to dis disentangle those populations. And that would obviously lead to inflated rates of uh, commitment for white folks. So in these states, Kansas, New York, and Texas, looking at the adult resident uh, denominator that we talked about before, you can see these trends. Most states, um, black folks have a higher rate of commitment. Uh, Kansas was exceptional in this case. But if we compare it to um, using instead the, the registry as the denominator, uh, the trends kind of flip. Um, and you can see whites face higher rates of commitment um, if you look at uh, 100,000 uh, rates per 100,000 publicly registered sex offenders um, in, in every state, uh, although pretty close in Texas, but uh, much bigger differences in New York and especially in Kansas. Um, and so we don't, you know, in the report, we just note this disparity in the book. I hope to get a lot of more grist for the will to try, grist for the mill to try to understand what's driving this. Why do we see this? Is, is it fair to say that these laws disproportionately impact people of color? I, I, is it fair to say that that white folks are disproportionately impacted? I think it right depends on how you kind of look at it. And that's one of the questions that I'm really grappling with and eager to hear some feedback on. So just to kind of summarize there, the data suggests civil commitment laws disproportionately impact uh, black male adult residents. Um, but then further analysis suggests these da data uh, disparities may just be artifacts of racialized interactions with the criminal justice system. But, so it may just be about getting that sex offense. That's where the, the, the racial disparities form and then they carry over um, uh, in part to the civil commitment side. Um, it's, it's a narrative that I'm obviously is still in formation as I try to make sense of some of these figures. Moving on to sexuality, um, there is no agency at the state or federal level for corrections and for sex offenses that systematically collects sexual orientation information. So that data isn't available. The only thing that is available that allows us to get a little bit of insight here is victim gender um, for, for the criminal offenses that they were convicted of. This data exists in Texas and New York on their public sex offender registry. And I wanna recognize and italicize and highlight that I know that this is not perfect and that there's a whole can of worms that comes with that because obviously behavior and identity are not you know, the same thing. And I don't mean to say that they are. So I just wanna really put that in bold. It's all we kind of got. So this is what we're, we're trying to understand and see, do these laws disproportionately impact men who have sex with men? Um, and this is kind of the only variable that allows us to try to get some any, any level of insight into that. So in New York, what did we find? Well, we found that among registered sex offenders, about one in eight had male victims. And that among the civilly committed population, about one in three had male victims. So quite a large disparity between the two. 
Um, so among civilly committed men, um, 33% had were convicted of offenses with male, male victims among registered sex offender, a much smaller share. So there does seem to be um, a, a sizable disparity there between the registry and then those who are civilly committed. This trend is consistent for black, white, and Hispanic folks. Um, and you can see there are differences in the size of, uh, uh, of the disparity um, between black, white, and Hispanic folks, but it's a trend that's consistent in each group um, with much higher um, uh, rates of civil commitment among um, people who have been convicted of offenses with male victims. Texas, almost the same trend. Uh, very similar, about one in 10 registered sex offenders had male victims, um, about one in three of civilly committed persons had male victims. Um, so really mirroring what we saw in New York. And again, that trend is consistent, that disparity is consistent for both black, uh, for all black, white and Hispanic uh, folks. And so this to me is just the tip of the iceberg and obviously there's more to um, to say and to do to try to get a handle on this. But in this report, we just put that out there to, to hopefully encourage other folks to, to look more into this question of sexuality. Why do we think this is? What could be driving this? Obviously, we just see the disparity in the report. We can't test for the, the forces driving it. But one factor that we identify is a psychometric instrument um, called the static 99 that's used to um, assess the risk of people who are candidates for civil commitment. Uh, we'll look at the items in just a second so you understand what this looks like. But one of the 10 items on this, this uh, instrument is uh, the question of whether or not the person had a male victim. And if you had a male victim, you're assigned one point. Um, and so that automatically leads you to be um, considered a higher risk and a better candidate, therefore, for civil commitment. So you can see there's a variety of variables and there's not any theory behind these. These are just um, associations found in large samples of sex offenders that, that have been published. Um, and so this is the instrument that they have devised to evaluate people for civil commitment. Um, and obviously there are other variables at play, but you can see one point can make a big difference. The labels on the left, the scores associated with low, low to moderate, moderate to high and high uh, risk, you know, um, can vary by small numbers, right? Uh, two or three is low to moderate versus four to five for moderate to high to six or more is high. Um, and so there, along with other items, there is concern that some of these may, um, effectively instrument, implement a kind of discrimination against uh, men who have sex with men, gay, bisexual, and other men who have sex with men. Um, so just again, just to kind of summarize here, the data suggests gay by MSM may be disproportionately civil committed. This is consistent across racial categories. Um, although you know, we recognize that there is much more research necessary to be done to understand what's driving these disparities. What are the forces at play here? I'm going to also briefly talk about my research in Florida, which is not part of the Williams Institute report, but is, is the case study that's going to drive um, a lot of the nitty, nitty gritty elements of the book. And that's because Florida is unusual. Um, I cannot get records um, at the, the individual level, really in any state in the United States except for Florida. Uh, they have a very robust public records law, and it's, it's extremely easy to get access to information about who's in the civil commitment facility, what is their criminal record. Um, transcripts of these cases are often posted publicly on court clerk websites. Um, and it's the only state that's like that. Um, you might find a couple of cases that you could get access to in some states, but nothing approaches Florida. And so, um, you know, luckily, Florida is an important state here in the sense that it's the second largest program in the United States, a very large number of detainees. Um, so it sort of overlaps in that useful way. Um, but this will be the state that I'll be able to get the most granular detail about who's being um, detained in these facilities. 
And I do that through combining four data sources. Um, the first is public records from the Department of Children's Family. And this is roughly a thousand people who were civilly committed through March 22nd, 2019. This includes DSM diagnoses. So if they have been diagnosed with a, a disorder that's in the DSM, that would be noted here. Um, this effectively amounts to the population of people who had been found to be a sexually violent predator, either by judge or jury, or had waived their trial and voluntarily committed themselves. Um, so anyone who is awaiting trial would not be here in this data set. Um, and that's a fair number of people um, because these, these cases can take years to get to trial. Um, so I, I, I use other data sources to kind of fill in the gaps of that data set. So the second one is the Florida Sex Offender Registry. I hired a freelancer to scrape the registry of Florida. Um, that includes 75,000 roughly registered sex offenders. This includes their sex offense history. And um, there are several ways in these records to identify who's in civil commitment. You can see here is an example of the registry and the designated uh, the designator, this person is in a civil commitment facility. Um, so this would represent the population. This allows me to get to the population of current uh, detainees who are registered as Florida sex offenders, um, including those who are detained and awaiting trial. So those, some of those cases that are not in the Department of Children and Families uh, data set. I also use the Florida Department of Corrections data set. Uh, again, web scrape data from their public uh, uh, website, um, including data on 96,000 current and 404,000 released inmates. Uh, and the reason this is useful is because as you see on the right, their records include these detainers at the bottom. There is really nothing else that these detainers signify. Uh, sometimes, it, there are, there are rare cases that are not sexually violent predator cases, but almost all of them are. And so this is sort of a backwards way to create a data set of people who have been petitioned. Um, and that includes some of those uh, folks who were never actually detained, um, which is um, especially hard population to get at. And then finally, the Florida clerks of court. Uh, the local counties all have clerk websites. Many of them are uh, easy to kind of backwards engineer their databases uh, through a variety of search techniques. Um, and that varies by county, but in many counties, it's possible to uh, uh, do many, many searches in order to identify uh, everyone who's been petitioned in that county uh, for civil commitment. So cobbling together all four of these data sets has allowed me to create this original data set of 1,600 petitions persons between the years 1999 and 2019. Um, by and large, in almost every case, I have their race, gender, and date of birth. Many cases, 85%, I have their admission and discharge dates. And then in those cases where they were found uh, in the Department of Children and Families data set, um, I have their, the, the diagnoses that drove their commitment in 62% of the cases. Um, collectively, these 1,600 cases represent virtually all petitioned persons. A, a couple of um, blind spots that we could talk about, but they're very small, mostly dealing with juvenile offenders who are um, harder to identify. Just going to give a gloss to some of the key findings, you know, just coming out of this Florida data set, looking at uh, the racial demographics, a little more than a third of people petitioned for civil commitment in Florida. Um, are black, about 58% white, 6% um, Hispanic. Um, and um, so this sort of, uh, it, it, there is a greater share here among uh, residents of black folks than, than would be expected, a um, smaller share of white folks. Um, here I don't have rates on this slide, but obviously that's something that will be in this research. Um, looking at the time of detention for among those who were released, so roughly a thousand who were released, how long did they spend in civil commitment? Um, you can see variation by race, about 2,200 days for white folks. I think that's about eight years, about a year less uh, for black folks and um, maybe two or three years less for Hispanic folks. Um, so 
again, this is a bit of an unexpected trend right here um, for, for longer detentions um, being identified for white folks, especially given this finding that among static 99 scores uh, for those cases that had them, about 700 cases, um, we, uh, we observed you know, higher rate, higher static 99 scores for black detainees than for white detainees. Uh, pretty similar rates for Hispanic. Um, so there's a minimum and a maximum um, score. That, that's how I sort of cobbled it together. Um, that's how they reported the data as the men and the max for their static 99. Um, so that's that comes out of their data set. Um, but you can see there are small but noticeable differences. Uh, this is also true, uh, although the differences are a little smaller for the static 99R. This is the revised instrument. It also has the same question about victim gender. Um, you know, so it doesn't differ in that regard, but nonetheless, you see um, this disparity. So I'm really interested in, in, in thinking through and, and identifying, you know, what makes these cases seem um, like good candidates for, for civil commitment. And static 99 is one driver of that, but there are obviously others. Looking at DSM diagnoses, I know this is a lot um, of information. Not surprisingly, the leading DSM uh, category that's driving these, these commitments is uh, 302, which is sexual deviations and disorders. Um, and what's interesting to me here is among personality disorders, a, a much higher percentage of black uh, detainees um, had that diagnosis on record. Um, so I, there's a lot more work to do here to, to recode, not just um, to, in, in more granular detail, not just the sort of the category, but the various um, elements within it. Um, and that's what I hope to do moving forward. This is just something I've cobbled together for this presentation uh, to kind of have something to talk about um, for these, these DSM categories. So, you know, the kind of lingering questions that I would love to talk about and hear your thoughts about um, is, you know, one, how do we make sense how of the sociological nature of this, this racialized system? Um, does it, you know, what do we glean from using sex offenders as the denominator? Um, yeah, how do we make sense of this system? Does it echo those historians' findings of sexual psychopath laws that, that you know, white, particularly gay men were more, more likely to be affected by. Um, I'm also interested in looking ar through archives, what, what are the perceived threats that are driving lawmakers to enact these laws? Is it crimes that involve white children or, or black offenders? Um, that's one sort of element to thinking about how these, these categories are constructed. And I'm, I'm compiling all these archives right now, but, but um, it's still work in progress. Obviously, I'm very interested in the sexuality dynamics here and trying to think through any ways that I can get grist or, or some, some traction on, on testing or measuring or thinking through the influence of the Static 99, as well as other forces that might be shaping this, this big difference between the civilly committed population and the registered sex offender population. Um, so if there are ideas you have, you know, I'm eager to hear them for whether there might be other measures that could kind of get at some of these issues, um, either kind of systematically or more at a qualitative kind of localized level. I'm also dealing with a da data set of a size that I've never uh, kind of grappled with before. Um, I'm compiling a data set of, of well over 100,000 court documents probably dealing in the millions of pages. Some of these documents are hundreds and hundreds of pages. Um, and it is just a problem I've, I've not faced. Um, in my last project, I dealt with a law that the, the HIV laws that impacted dozens, maybe hundreds of people. And now we're talking about you know, thousands of cases that go on for not just a short period of time, but these cases you know, are protracted. They go on for decades. And so you get all these records, which is both a gold mine and feels like a bit of a trap um, just because it's, it's hard to get, um, hard to deal with. Um, so I'm considering things like, 
Amazon Web Services has a cloud um, system where you can input large amounts of documents and it'll kind of spit out ways to make sense of it. I'm just trying to think of new methods to try to, that'll help me. Um, obviously I could do things like a random sample and do a qualitative analysis of smaller numbers of, of cases. Um, it's just a problem I've not dealt with. So I'm, I'm, if anyone has any tips or, or tricks, I'd be thrilled to hear them. Um, so those are just some things I'd love to talk about, but obviously there's a lot in this project. And if people want to take me down any number of rabbit holes, please feel free. Um, and if you want to reach out to me, my email is there. I'm on Twitter, uh, whatever, whatever um, is easiest for you. Uh, and I also have to thank my co-authors, Elon Meyer, um, Stefan Vogler, Scott DiOrio, and Megan Armstrong, who helped make that Williams Institute report possible. Um, so I really, again, I'm so grateful for your time and really looking forward to some conversation about these issues. So uh, thank you. Um, we're gonna open up for question uh, Q and A. And so if you write in the chat stack, we will, I'll be reading from there. Uh, Ian Long. Hi, long time no see. Good to see you here. Uh, it's fascinating to uh, hear about your new research. Um, I have a, two questions. Um, that comes from a place where, because I'm not a legal scholar, so um, please bear with me. The first question is, uh, what is your normative sort of take on this law? So I'm sure there is sort of a normative um, implication here, and I would love to hear more about it. And the second question is that, how do we see this sort of new system in relations to, let's see, the larger um, legal system in dealing with sexual um, violence, sex offense? For example, um, how about the conviction rate? Because I know the conviction rate is very low. Um, I think if I remember correctly, I think a report of rape leading to arrest, so that's like 50% and the conviction rate extremely low. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk more about that um, and also, I'm, I'm just very curious about um, if this is a race, if it's a racial, is a gender problem, or what about age? Um, because I remember I, I, I read a report from the Bureau of Justice, and it sounds like violent sex offenders, there is a very big sort of portion of the offense, um, their victims are children under the age of 18. And a very significant portion um, is children under 12. So I'm also in the end you talk about, okay, it might be a white children. So I don't know if this is more, because when we talk about the deviation, this is not just, you know, homosexual, heterosexual, but there is also age, um, age factor there. And I think uh, feminist scholars, sexuality scholars have been debating about it for a very, very long time. So I'm curious to hear what, what you think and what's your sense of this data, what, you know, it, especially when the flurry data can give you more sort of details. Thanks, Jan. It's great to see you. I really appreciate your questions. It's uh, a set of questions that I am uh, have ha have struggled to find the words with sometimes because it's, it's complicated. Um, criminologists study difficult crimes often, you know, crimes like homicide, crimes that obviously, you know, we don't, we don't want people to, to be able to do and, and not be punished for, right? So the suggestion is not that, that some sort of response is, is not uh, necessary or needed. It's more just that we've devised this special set of controls dealing with just sex offenses. And I do sometimes wonder whether it's a canary in a coal mine situation where this kind of preventative detention might bleed over eventually to other kinds of offenses. Um, because that's what we're kind of talking about here is this idea that if we could figure out who is going to reoffend, who is likely to reoffend, we could just keep them detained, and and that would prevent them from reoffending down the line. It's a very expensive, obvious way to deal with crime, um, but you could imagine other systems of control, you know, could be devised to deal with other kinds of crime like homicide or or anything else. Obviously, that has not happened yet, but I do. It's a question that kind of haunts me: Is this about sex, period, or is it a kind of control that the state 
is kind of piloting here around sex offenses with maybe some aspiration to, 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 to try it in other areas. I don't know. Um, in terms of normatively, um, there's, it's hard to talk about these cases in a normative way because there's so much variation, right, in what we're talking about. Um, just like with sex offenses, generally, it's a capacious category. And so you have cases that are easier to talk about. You know, like I've identified cases where someone was convicted in the 1970s of a sex offense and then moved to Florida in the 2000s and didn't register. And failure to register is a crime. And he went to prison for that crime. And then they committed him upon exit of prison for that. That to me seems excessive, right? There was no real underlying um, you know, behavior that, that seems like it would justify locking someone up for potentially the rest of their life just because they didn't register when they moved to Florida. That is an easier case to talk about than some of the other cases that are more challenging. I mean, it, it, many of these cases are, there's no, there's no way to dismiss or minimize the, the harm that some of these folks have, 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 um, have wrought. Um, you know, we do have cases involving kidnapping, uh, minors, uh, murder. Uh, it, it's not an easy <laughs> group of cases to talk about. So I'm still finding the language, um, but I do think it's, what I do note is that I find it really interesting that around other kinds of offenses that are also heinous and wrong, violent criminal offenses, there's a movement to kind of, um, um, to, to humanize those defendants and to, to think about restorative justice and other ways to, to approach those offenders and, and ways that don't involve imprisoning them for the rest of their lives. Um, but sex offenses have this kind of special um, kind of, uh, they're, 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 they're blocked off in a different category where there's not a lot of willingness to think about people convicted of sex offenses as um, redeemable. Um, so I, I hear you, it is not easy and a challenge to, to think about really what is underlying some of these cases because in some cases it is really hard to talk about. Um, whereas I, and I differentiate that for myself when I worked on the HIV laws, um, these were laws where people living with HIV could be imprisoned for not telling someone that they were positive. Um, it was very rare for me to find a case where I could say, this person should have been imprisoned for this behavior, you know, it, it, from a normative perspective. Um, in this hand, you know, many of these folks uh, have done wrong and deserve some sort of punishment. So it's a little harder to talk about um, in a kind of sweeping way. So I'm, uh, it's a work in progress in that regard. And so I appreciate the question because it's one that I really struggle and am thinking a lot about. I'm sorry, I was thinking about what you said and got uh, distracted from my other task of Armando. Uh, please. Uh... Thank you, Sam. Um, hi, Trevor, thank you for the, the intriguing talk. I am trying to wrap my head around the, um, the kind of puzzle that you're trying to construct and explain. And so I, so one, one, so I have question, related questions around that. So one, I mean, I, I, I was personally intrigued by the puzzle of why, I mean, why are there so many um, non-detained registered offenders versus detained? And that, I mean, that seems like a, an interesting puzzle in itself. Um, and so I, I was wondering if there were, if that had changed historically, perhaps there was a growth in one caseload versus the not the other, or maybe it had flipped. Um, I mean, it's intriguing to me why we're willing to, or why in this age of um, fear of crime, we're, we're kind of willing to have lots of people out in the community versus detained. Um, the second question is on this, the racial disparity that you were kind of zooming into. So in the, with the kind of 20 states data, it, it seemed like the finding was that 
there were sort of black people were more disproportionately detained. And then when you zoomed into the Florida case, it, it seemed like the finding that the puzzle there was white people were spending longer time detained. And um, I, so is your hypothesis that what might explain both of these is the different ways that um, male victims are kind of conceived of within the, the system. And I thought my, I mean, you were, so you're asking for suggestions around this. So if that's the case, I was thinking about kind of the organizational perspective and thinking about the, maybe unpacking some of the entry versus exit points. So like what organizations are deciding who's entering detainment versus um, going the registration route um, who's in charge of that? How's that changing? And then who's in charge of exit? So who's exiting? Um, who's in charge of, uh, you know, release basically. So like incarceration versus release. Cause it, it strikes me that those are different organizations that at times may be talking to one another and other times not, and probably have different goals and aims. So I was wondering if you could maybe speak to those issues. Thanks Armando. That's a really great way to, to frame it. And that's helpful to think through. Um, certainly in Florida, I'll be able to see the exit very clearly because it's the judiciary, it's a judge that determines whether someone um, is released or not. Um, oftentimes at the, the um, uh, you know, the, the Department of Children and Family uh, argues, you know, or, or says this person is ready to be released and then the judge will certify, you know, okay, you're released. Sometimes uh, the judge forces their release against the the recommendations of the Department of Children and Family for a variety of reasons. Um, so that I will definitely can imagine getting some handle on. It's tougher, the entry is much more opaque um, because it is usually the agency like uh, the Department of Children and Families or a Health and Human Services Department, something like that, a welfare uh, kind of agency of the state that that vets potential candidates. And then it's the state attorney general who ultimately decides to file the petition. Um, so there are different, as you say, actors with different agendas there that's, that's worth considering. Um, and you know, I, I, I think in some places, some of those folks may be willing to talk to me and I, I, I hope to try. Um, We'll see. Uh, so, so that kind of interview stuff, look, talking to psych, um, forensic psychiatrists who, who evaluate these candidates, I think would be helpful. Talking to the team of people who, who at the Department of Children and Family and other similar agencies, um, and attorneys general, if they would be willing to talk to me. Um, so, yes, uh, it's 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 sort of challenging because in most states there's just nothing it's just a a, a black box they, they you don't get to know anything about these cases um so hopefully i will be able to get to some of those questions um but i, I like that organizational framing is helpful so i appreciate that thank you uh david showalter uh, hi, hi, Trevor. Thanks for a really interesting talk. And my question is similar to Armando, so it might have a similar answer. Um, and uh, you talked a lot about state level variation. I was just wondering if you could say anything about county level variation, since that's often, you know, where the actions at and other aspects of the criminal legal system. Um, I know that in, or I, I was uh, under the impression that in some states, there was a role for local prosecutors in initiating these proceedings. And I was wondering um, if you could say anything um, about the role of sort of local officials or of court communities in, um, in this process um, might be different in Florida or if you could talk about differences across states. Um, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you, that's helpful. Um, I am most familiar with cases where the state attorney general initiates these proceedings and that's one way that these cases are often, you can find them in Florida because the attorney on the, it's not the prosecution, right? Cause it's not a criminal case, but it's on that side, it's the state attorney who is on that side versus the county attorney. And that's unusual. Um, it, so it's easier to find these cases because of that element. Um, it may well be that, that in some states uh, it could be count, county prosecutors. In Florida, 
you do, you know, I would, I would need to generate rates by county and it's certainly possible to do that. I just, I have not done yet. Um, immediately, it, you know, I don't see that there's a lot, it, it's like the, you would, the counties with a lot of cases are some of the ones you would expect, like Miami-Dade has the most number of cases. And so, it, you know, off just the very superficial level, I don't see any like red flags, um, but it's definitely worth getting into more detail. In any other state, I don't think I'll be able to measure that at all um, because there's no information available on the number of cases per county. It's just not something that's that I could get any information about. So I'm sort of stuck with Florida. Um, why Florida? It's always Florida, right? Um, so, so I am interested in that question and I appreciate that and I think Yes, uh, at least in that case, I can try to to assess county level variation, um, which would be really interesting. Then, if it is the attor state attorney, how do you explain county level variation? There would be something going on there worth exploring. So, thank you. And said that. Yeah. Hi, Trevor. Uh, that was great. So I have three different comments. One at the sort of most I don't know big culture level which is, it seems to me, you have to think about this issue of how the image emerged and to what the image applies that some sexual crimes are the result of deep psychological compulsions that cannot change. So these are not just people who did something wrong, something very wrong, something bad, bad, bad. They are people who cannot be cured of whatever it is that's causing this compulsion. And that seems to me especially applies at least in our popular image to pedophilia. So I'm wondering if you have data on what proportion of the offenders who, this is going back to Armando's question, why do a lot of these people, and my image would be that your garden variety rapist might be still allowed to walk the streets but that somebody convicted of certain kinds of pedophilia crimes could be locked up forever because people believe, whether it's true or not, that this is a, an incurable, deep illness. So I'm wondering if there's a way to get at that, either by looking at when this image emerged in the popular press, in the psychiatric journals. I have no idea whether there's any validity to the idea that this is an incurable, you know, an incurable compulsion that will, that's why you could justify, at least in your imagination, some kind of prior restraint, right? It isn't a matter of waiting to see if the person's gonna be a recidivist. You know that if that person's let out, and this is a little Silence of the Lambs type territory, but, but anyway, so that's my first question is, is there a way of getting at that? And more specifically, is it particularly crimes involving children that are likely to get you committed permanently? The second is a, a suggestion, which is you may already be in touch with Monty Lichtenstein, but if you're not, she is a phenomenal graduate student in our department. Um, you do know her, are you nodding yes? No, all right. Lichtenstein is last name, first name, M-A-T-T-Y. And I'll just say she has been working on um, how child protective services became the coercive surveillance and child taking away, I've forgotten what you call that, but anyway, the, the terribly uh, destructive set of practices. And it seems to me that part of the answer to your anomaly of the cross state differences, why Minnesota, but not, you know, you would think Mississippi or something. And so I, I don't wanna preview her entire argument in her dissertation, but I'll just say the two of you might even collaborate because she has come to think that one dimension of this is institutional capacity and that even states that have very punitive intentions, I think South Carolina shows up as a big, um, has actually tried to criminalize uh, mothers' drug use that might harm their children, but they just don't have any administrative capacity to enforce that. Whereas some states you would think of as potentially quite liberal, I think Wisconsin shows up as very high, have enormously 
elaborate institutional capacity. So I was thinking actually you and she, she's collected boodles of data. So if she wanted, I mean, really vast amounts. And so you might want to, we certainly should get in touch with her. You certainly should look at her arguments. She has a paper, I think she might have even submitted to a journal. So there, there's some that's far enough along for the look. The third thing is in terms of your vast amounts of data and you don't know how to analyze them, I could send you, I, I saved a story from the New York Times from at now six or eight years ago about how attorneys were being um, driven out of business by the enormously sophisticated language processing, you know, artificial <laughs> intelligence systems of law firms. Now those, and that they can read tens or hundreds of thousands of pages of depositions very, very efficiently and find exactly what they're looking for. And they actually do a better job than teams of 500 attorneys. So I was thinking those are presumably proprietary systems that you can't get hold of. But if you found a collaborator in the kind of law firm that deals with this sort of case, you might actually be able to find someone who'd be happy to loan you or let you run your data through their very expensive legal text reading program. Of course, you could use a lot of you know, data science type applications, but those in my personal view don't always give you what you want. So you have to learn how to use them and then Lord knows whether you get anything useful. Okay, those are my three levels of comment. Thank you, Anne, that's really helpful. Um, I'll, I'll try to go through them and remember, the, the, so the predator question first, it is not the only case where you see this discourse of predator appear, right? Uh, we, we got reminded of that with Hillary Clinton and the super predator discourse around, um, you know, urban or inner city black men in particular. Um, so it's not unique in that sense. And I think the same kind of view was there that these folks were irredeemable, that they were, they were uncontrollable and that that's why you had to have things like three strikes laws um, uh, where you where you just put people away for the rest of their lives. Um, so I, I do think that there are parallels definitely um, that'll help me kind of create that story of, of circulating discourses that aren't just about sex, but about criminality more broadly. Um, so I, I'm, I'm keen to kind of to, to, to dig into that um, in, in, in at least one chapter of the book. Um, uh, the predator discourse, is, is there any truth to it, right? I mean, like anything, it depends on who you ask. Uh, th there is a problem with recidivism rates for sex offenses, which Yan already pointed at, which is that the conviction rates, um, reporting rates are low and conviction rates are low. And so how do you measure recidivism if you've got this issue? Um, so empirically, you know, studies will say that sex offenders do not have necessarily higher rates of recidivism. Um, I do think a serious reading of that literature would require more to say about it than that, which would just be to say that there is a lot that we don't know about, um, and that is specific to this kind of crime. And so you don't want to just swipe that under the rug, because I think that's disingenuous. Um, so... I hope to really dig into that, and and I I I, I haven't come to a, a neat little sentence explaining um, recidivism rates, but I will just say that the literature would say that there's not necessarily higher rates of of recidivism there. And, um, what, what and in fact, there are children. Uh, just sorry, what what about people who target children? The the you know pedophilia question. Yeah, there definitely that's that's you'll find a lot of that. And I don't have a number for you at this moment. Um, and in part because it's such a sensitive issue that I want to be able to have a robust, you know, kind of analysis before I put it out there, because I think it's just it's very challenging to 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 deal with. But yes, certainly a lot of the fear of of crimes against children drives this, um, not just in terms of the legislature, but also in terms of um, who is being um, detained. Um, so in Florida, I'll be able to, you know, really identify that. New York and Texas also age, age of the victim is there. So 
that'll be possible to do. So I will be able to get a couple more states in the mix um, to, to say more definitively about that. Um, and obviously that's also part of the problem with the sexuality discourse is you don't want to, you know, I think scholars of, of folks uh, who suffer from pedophilia and other related kind of DSM issues, you know, it's not always about the, the gender of the victim. Um, and so that complicates, you know, some of that analysis. So I, I recognize that I just, I don't, I'm not ready to open that box because it's, it's going to require a lot more uh, to say about it. Um, so I appreciate the, the concern and thought because it's right on the money in terms of what's going on here. I think there's a lot to say about it. Um, predator discourse. Um, the second was, uh, sorry, I, I get off. I, can you? Mati Lichtenstein, find her. Yes, I appreciate that because I think there is something going on about um, that th th needs more uh, to say. And I think that makes a lot of sense. And that's very helpful framework for thinking about that capacity issue. Um, so thank you. And, and the third one, I'm sorry, there was a third one. <laughs> law firms have fancy. Ah, yes. I have a friend at a very fancy New York law firm and he said this very same thing and he promised to hook me up with his colleague who, so yes, uh, I'm on it. Um, I, I do not know whether they'll allow me to use their fancy proprietary software. Um, I hope there's a way to do it, um, but I have very little money. Um, so I, we'll see. Uh, Amazon, you know, does have neural network kind of cloud computing stuff that you can rent at pretty low prices. Um, and I agree, it's not perfect. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to exploring those options because they're methods, you know, or analytic approaches that I've, I've never had the opportunity to use. Um, Irene. Okay. Um, hi, Trevor. I'm going to apologize first because I'm outside. So I apologize if you hear road noise, but I had to take a child to an extracurricular activity, um, but was enjoying the talk while I was doing that. Um, I wanted to maybe ask a, a variation of Yen's question, but I'm not sure if this is what she was getting at. And then a question around immigration. So on maybe the feminist question, one way to potentially interpret your findings about um, potentially disproportionate detention for um, men on men's sex would be this is the continuation of historic criminalization of homosexuality um, and so forth. And other, either different or complementary argument would be when the victim is female, either a child or a domestic partner, um, if there's violence, it's, it's seen as more normal, it's not seen as sick, and so it does not uh, cause the same sort of detention procedures. And, you know, you pointed out on those points that um, male or, I guess, uh, same-sex um, activity was considered a point, but I was really struck by the fact that uh, a lot of it was about uh, sexual behavior against strangers, and so if it was within a family for some reason that's considered fine or normal. And so I was curious how you are thinking through those alternative ways of, of thinking about higher incidence of, of male and male sex detention in your, in your study. And then this is more of a minor point, but whenever I hear about indefinite detention or um, uh, detainers, for me, that means immigration. Um, so, as you might or might not know, immigrants can be detained indefinitely, um, even if they've committed no crime or they've come after serving their crime and they can be locked up forever. Um, and similarly, uh, detainers are put on people who are uh, in jail and potentially have an immigration violation. So I was wondering if, if there's any possibility that some of your data might actually be picking up immigration enforcement rather than just the topic that you're interested in. Um, thanks, and I'll, I'll turn off the video. So don't get Thank you for that, that's, that's really great. And I'm glad you're outside. That's one of the beauties of this world we're living in is we can be 
all so many different places and having these conversations. I think that's wonderful. It's dark and dreary here, so I'm jealous. Um, I went back to that slide with these, these elements in the Static 99, because yeah, it's really fascinating. And I think there's a lot going on here that's not just about the male victims part, but, but, but I, I think about my, you know, my own self at 22, and if I had been convicted of a sex offense, um, you know, there are so many elements here that as a gay man, um, you know, um, ever lived with someone, for example, right, might be another kind of um, question that is complicated for, for gay men versus other kinds of men. So I, there's no end to my fascination with this document. I think it's really, um, or this instrument, I think there's a lot to, to ask questions about it. Um, in terms of the detainers, um, there's a different uh, language that's used with it when it's an immigration detainer on, on, the, on the Department of Corrections website. So it's, it's easy to separate those out. There's just a couple of cases that I've run into with domestic violence cases, and you can pretty, they're, they're self-evident. It's, it's, once you look at the case, you can see what's going on. So I did have to filter out, it's less than a dozen, it's a small number of cases, but most, almost every case when they say a detainer, in the way that the first or second or whatever judicial circuit, it means, this is what it means. It's a sexually violent predator case. Um, but thankfully, because Florida, I can, I can look in more depth to make sure that that's what's going on. So I've always looked more deeply to make sure that these cases are, um, they call them Jimmy Rice Act. Uh, that's the name of the law. Um, again, sort of speaking to some of Anne's you know, questions, Jimmy Rice was a child who was, who was murdered and, um, and, and discussion about that crime drove at least the name of the statute. Um, and that's how these cases are referred to there. Um, so luckily I'm able to differentiate those kinds of cases, but you're right to say that, you know, there are other classes of people uh, such as immigrants to whom the same kinds of due process and constitutional protections are not afforded. Um, so I, I appreciate that. And I think you're right that a lot of the same mechanisms are probably um, in play in the sense that it's often, you know, it's a civil proceeding, not necessarily a criminal proceeding. And so there's probably some similar issues in terms of evidence and, the legal matter. It's, um, so it's, I appreciate reminding me of the, the, the need to make those connections. Okay, well, I had the next question, but I, well, my, uh, I'll just ask, could you say something about the, I think Irene also asked about two different bases of what might be the, Finding one, it's an attempt to uh, uh, more intensively police gay men. The other is it's an attempt to ignore uh, victimized uh, people. Like so, and she was wondering what you thought about. It. I had another question, but since she's she's not able to come back, I thought I would see if what you thought about that. Uh, is that um, is, is that question sort of is this is this about um you know, how harshly we punish sex offenders versus how we don't punish sex offenders. Like it's, it's sort of a weird duality. Is that kind of what you're kind of getting at? That it seems to be these deep forms of punishment at the same time, we know there's low levels of reporting and, and, and conviction among many kinds of sex offenses. You're, Sorry, you're muted. Trevor. I was yeah. trying to ask a question. So that, I, mean, yeah. I, I apologize. I'm just, I'm not gonna put on my video. You really don't want to see all these kids. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think the question was, yeah, that there could be like, you know, multiple dynamics going on, one of which is uh, criminalization or, or a view of deviance in terms of gay sex, but a, a second dynamic or maybe an alternative explanation for some people would be that when men or boys are victims, that brings the criminal justice system down harder than if women are victims with a variety of different, you know, experiences within families, without families, with violence, without violence. And, and you know, those two things might be reinforcing in, verse, in certain cases, but I was just curious as to how you can tease those potential dynamics out. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for, for, for reiterating that point, because it, it, yeah, it's definitely important. I'm interested, there's a whole literature on victim characteristics 
and how it can drive these disparities. The death penalty certainly uh, is one case where there's been a lot of work on this in terms of whether someone's convicted of a offense, a murder involving a white victim versus a, a black victim and whether they get the death penalty or not. Um, so here, I think there's also some, some thinking through to be done. We're dealing with almost all male offenders. So, you know, we don't have to, the, 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 the victim gender is, you know, almost is necessarily, you don't have any female offenders to really talk about. Um, so you can't really look at that case, those cases. But, um, but yeah, we certainly see, I mean, in my last work, for example, in HIV laws, you know, where the victim was female, the sentence was much longer versus where the male, you know, when there were, there were male victims. Um, so it's questions that I'm attuned to and I, I'm not prepared to kind of, I haven't really, um, I haven't done the analysis thorough enough to really answer that uh, more fully, but I, I think it's a great point and one that I definitely think a lot about. I, I, I'm trying to think of what the word, um, there was a word for it in the criminology literature. They sort of um, talk about it as, um, um, it's ironic in the sense that female offenders also um, are sentenced to shorter um, sentences often because they're viewed as not as much of a threat. Um, so there's definitely a lot going on with gender. I mean, it's sexuality related cases. So definitely gender is front and center. Um, and I hope to um, work through some of those issues. So uh, that was great. We are at our end. And I want to thank you for a uh, thoughtful and engaging presentation. So uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it, everyone. And um, Enjoy the rest of your evenings and uh, please do uh, be in touch as makes sense. Thanks, Sam, for moderating. Oh, my appreciate pleasure. Uh, we'll talk about I, my question, but I'll let you go. It's late where you are. Um, am I muted or are you muted? I can't hear you. No, no, I'm not. I, 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 I have developed this like not talking thing on Zoom pretty well so sometimes people think i'm muted but i know i'm just gesturing wildly with my hands but yes let's talk soon please yeah. i mean did you have something you wanted to or barbara did you have something you wanted to say oh barbara you're muted barbara, now you're muted thank you okay <laughs> and i and i have to figure out how to ask questions <laughs> from where i am um irene will i'll get a chance to talk to uh Trevor, so that wasn't a big deal. Your question was better.